All right. Well, thanks for coming out tonight, everybody. I know that uh, high blood pressure is always one of those topics that just gets everybody right out of the uh, right out of the house and uh, in, into the audience there. We're going to talk about high blood pressure for a little while tonight. We're going to talk about a handful of different aspects of it. And as you can see by the subtitle up here, high blood pressure is uh, what we call the silent killer because there are a lot of times that high blood pressure will not have any real signs or symptoms until uh, something bad happens, whether it's a stroke or a heart attack or something along those lines. So it's really important to, uh, to, to pay attention to high blood pressure. Well, why should I care? I mean, so some of you out there will likely have high blood pressure. Some of you will uh, uh, go on to develop high blood pressure, and actually a very small minority of folks will actually get through their life without ever having it. Uh, why is it a big deal? As you can see, 384,000 Americans uh, uh, it was the contributing cause, primary or contributing cause of death in 2009. That's a lot of folks, 384,000 folks, and it really does put a drag on the health care system. As you can see, $47.5 billion uh, annually in direct medical expenses. And then if you happen to be an employer, it counts for $3.5 billion a year in lost productivity. So in other words, hypertension contributes to your employees not being able to work up to their potential or, or, or be, be at work. Another reason why you should care. These are some interesting facts. I got these from the CDC. So people who come in with their first heart attack, about 69% of those folks will have high, uh, have high blood pressure. That's quite a bit, the vast majority. People who have a first stroke, 77% of people with their first stroke will come in and they'll have the diagnosis of high blood pressure. And 74% of people with chronic heart failure. Heart failure is a condition where the, body, the, the heart cannot pump blood well enough to keep the metabolic needs of the body going. So the heart's just not pumping blood well. It's failing at its job. So 74% of those folks will have uh, high blood pressure. So I mentioned that a lot of you out there probably have high blood pressure, and some of you are going to develop it, and there's very few, few that uh, will get, get through life without it. And this is just kind of what we call prevalence. In other words, prevalence is the, the, the percentage of people in the population that have a disease. So in this case, it's high blood pressure. So it, as you would expect, in the younger age group, 20 to 34, not too many folks, men and women are, are uh, pretty much there at the low end. But if you look down, as you get all the way down to 75 and older, or even 65 and older, you're still way above half of the folks. And if for women, as you get up above 75, it's almost 80% of women, uh, by the time they get to 75 or older, will develop high blood pressure. So it's almost uh, a foregone conclusion that if you live long enough, you will get blood pressure. And we're going to talk about some things as the night goes on that you can do to help reduce your risk of developing blood pressure or help control it if you do have it. But as you can see, this is something that really everybody needs to be paying attention to. What about the people that have high blood pressure and the people that are being treated? Well, 67 million Americans, 67 million Americans have high blood pressure. Uh, it's about one in every three people in the United States. So that's so. If you look to your left and look to your right, either you or the two, either you or uh, somebody next to you is going to have high blood pressure. And about tw almost 20 percent, just under 20 percent, go untreated. So in other words, you, there's. Uh, one fifth of the the one uh, the 67 million folks with high blood pressure that are running around with high blood pressure that either don't know they have it, or they're not on any medication. Of those of those 67 million that are treated, only 47 percent are actually controlled down to where we would like them to be. So not even half of people who are getting treated for high blood pressure are successfully controlled down to where they need to be. And there's a lot of things that go into that, and we'll talk about those as, as uh, time goes on. But that's kind, of a sobering, that's kind of a sobering fact there, that that many people have high blood pressure, that number of people don't know they have it, but of those that do have it, the majority aren't at, uh, at goal or where they need to be. All right, well, so we'll start off with a little bit of blood pressure 101. So what is blood pressure? Everybody talks about the top number and the bottom number, the systolic and the diastolic, but what does all that, that hoo-ha really mean? So here's basically what it is. The systolic 
That's the top number. That's usually that's always bigger than the bottom number. So the, the biggest number always goes on the top. The bottom, the lower number always goes on the bottom. The systolic is basically the pressure generated when the heart contracts. So we call that in, in medical terms, we call that systole. Systole is the contraction of the heart. So when the heart contracts, it pushes blood forward. And when it pushes blood forward, it generates a pressure to move it forward. And what causes the pressure is the uh, resistance of the vessels, uh, whether they're stiff, whether they're relaxed, whether they're contracted or dilated, in other words, constricted down or, or relaxed and real big. Uh, heart rate goes into there. Lots of different things go into, go into the, the, the pressure that's generated. But systolic, think of that as the pressure generated during contraction. Now, diastolic is what is left over in the system when the heart relaxes. Now, diastole, in medical terms, is when the heart relaxes. So diastole, the heart relaxes. The heart's not pushing any blood forward. And so the pressure that the, uh, the system comes down to is what we call the diastolic pressure. Sometimes people will call that the perfusion pressure because that's the pressure that is left over to kind of push blood into the, into the coronary arteries and into some of the other smaller arteries when the heart's not forcing blood forward. Now, of the two, the systolic is the one that we seem to concentrate on the most. They both have predictive value. They're both important to us. But the one that we pay the most attention to is the systolic. Way back when, historically, we paid a lot of attention to the diastolic, but then as we moved forward in time, we saw that the systolic really is kind of the one that we pay the, pay the most attention to. So what's the right range? Well, you'll hear people say, well, what's normal? 120 over 80 is normal. So you want to be at 120 over 80 or less, and there are some exceptions to that, but 120 uh, over 80 or less. But what's high blood pressure? High blood pressure is 140 over 90. Well, there's a whole bunch of room in the middle here. And so, well, what on God's earth is that? That's what we call prehypertension. Now, prehypertension is kind of a confusing thing. Uh, when we talk about prehypertension, you don't have a normal blood pressure, but you don't have high blood pressure. But what you do have is a high risk of going on to develop high blood pressure. We found that over time that folks who have prehypertension or whose blood pressure normally sits in that 135 over 85 kind of range have higher, uh, do have higher risks for heart disease and stroke, not as high as folks who have hypertension, but much higher than folks who have normal blood pressure. And we also note that those folks that are kind of sitting in this area have a much higher likelihood of going on to develop high blood pressure than these folks down here in the normal range. So those are kind of the numbers and, and ranges just to kind of keep in the back of your mind. And, and uh, you've got a hand out there so you can flip back and forth. But normal is 120 over 80. High is 140 over 90. And about 30% of Americans do have prehypertension. So uh, you know, if you think about that, there's one third of Americans that have hypertension, one third that have prehypertension. So it doesn't, it's not too surprising when you go back to that slide about prevalence that as we age, so many people, 60% or more, go on to develop high blood pressure uh, during their lifetime. Well, why do we treat high blood pressure? Well, besides that, it gives me something to do daily. It's, so we gotta, there's got to be a good reason to treat high blood pressure, otherwise we wouldn't do it. Well, lowering blood pressure, it'll reduce your risk of stroke, vascular mortality. Now, that's kind of a goofy phrase. What on God's earth does that mean? Vascular mortality is going to include stroke. It's going to include aneurysms and other problems that you have with the blood vessels. Coronary heart disease, that's the same, um, the same thing as blockages in your heart arteries. So it's going to help reduce your risk of heart attack. It also slows the progression. It doesn't necessarily prevent it, but it slows the progression of congestive heart failure. So if you imagine that your heart can't contract very well, you have a weak heart, it's going to be a lot harder for a weak heart to push against a high blood pressure than it is to push against a lower blood pressure. And actually, if you have high blood pressure for long enough, that can actually lead to heart failure. And the analogy that I like to use with folks is imagine if I gave you a five-pound weight and told you to sit here and curl it like this. Well, most of you would say, well, that's not a big deal. 
And now I tell you, never stop. Well, it's not going to take too long, and you might as well have a Volkswagen at the end of your arm because you're not going to be able to lift that five-pound weight to save your life. That's what happens with your heart and high blood pressure. Now, it doesn't happen that fast because the heart's a whole different type of muscle. But over time, the heart really does get tired of pushing against all that pressure. And after a while, it just says, ah, heck with it. I'm done. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm going to quit pumping very well. Uh, and we see that quite often when folks come into the, we get folks into the hospital or into the clinic who have uh, heart failure that the, the main cause is high blood pressure. Treating that can slow that process down. Same thing, all that blood pressure, every time your heart contracts, you get that high blood pressure and it, it's hitting the kidneys. Now the kidneys have these little teeny tiny things called glomeruli. That's a goofy word too, the medicine's full of goofy words. But the glomeruli is, is what takes the blood and filters it out and turns it into urine, okay? Now, the pressure, high blood pressure over time, can make those fibrotic and kind of kill off some of those glomeruli, and that will, over time, cause kidney failure. Ophthalmologic complications. So ophthalmologic, these are your eyeballs. Uh, it leads to plaques in your arteries, in your, in your, uh, in your eyes. It can reduce your, uh, reduce your visual acuity. Uh, you get all kinds of issues with, uh, with, with, with vision. So obviously vision is a big deal to everybody. You lose your vision and that uh, really changes your life. So how is treating your blood pressure can really help, uh, help that. And that's one that people don't really think of. They think about hearts, they think about brains, but people really don't think about your eyes until you, a lot of times you go to the eye doctors. And we'll get people referred in when they go in to get their glasses fixed or, or get a new prescription and somebody looks on the back of their eye and the next thing you know, they say, you need to go see the heart doctor or go see your regular doctor about your blood pressure. What can cause high blood pressure? The vast majority of people have what we call essential hypertension. That's a big $50 phrase for you have blood pressure because high blood pressure because you have high blood pressure. That's just the way you're put together. You can maybe blame your parents, you can blame something else, but it's what you call essential hypertension. That's just, you're just the way you're put together. Another big problem that we have is sleep apnea. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But sleep apnea is something that is becoming more and more of an issue, and untreated sleep apnea can cause very resistant high blood pressure or hypertension, and treating sleep apnea can help correct that. Gestational hypertension, uh, so this is basically uh, hypertension during pregnancy. Uh, the cure for that is to deliver the baby. Uh, so it's kind of a self-limited problem. However, if you do have gestational hypertension, you are at much higher risk of developing hypertension later in life. Hyperthyroidism, uh, this is uh, if your thyroid's overactive. Think of uh, thyroid as, as kind of the the octane in your gasoline, if you have hyperthyroidism or an overactive thyroid, it gets everything revved up, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. So correcting thyroid issues, high thyroid, not necessarily low thyroid, but high thyroid issues can make a di big difference. Atherosclerosis, in other words, blockages in the arteries or stiffening of the arteries, that can certainly cause it. We're gonna talk a little bit about renal artery stenosis here also because that's another one of those correctable causes. Uh, so I won't touch on that now. Some of the hormone things, such as uh, uh, polycystic ovarian disease, uh, adrenal tumors, uh, some of those other things can, can lead to high blood pressure. And some things that don't, people don't really think too much about, even the oral contraceptives and some of the, um, uh, the over-the-counter drugs can really contribute to, can contribute to uh, high blood pressure. So uh, if you do find yourself with blood pressure that's going up or, or difficult to treat, uh, talk to your talk to your healthcare provider and and just you know, tell them what kind of supplements you're taking or if you're taking a lot of Aleve or Advil or some of the other over the counter uh, over the counter NSAIDs or non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs which is what that stands for if you're taking a lot of those then you may need to back off on those or cut, we, you may need to work and see if there's something else you can take for the for the pain because sometimes those can really run up your run up your blood pressure. Obviously, obesity, the more you weigh, the uh, higher your blood pressure goes. And uh, alcohol, above moderate intake, can uh, increase your blood pressure. I got uh, some slides on all of that here coming up. So what are some of the risk factors? Those are some of the causes. What are some of the risk factors? Well, if you have family members who have high blood pressure, that's probably the biggest one. If both mom and dad had high blood pressure, 
it's pretty much in your cards. At some point, you're likely to develop high blood pressure. Uh, it makes it even more paramount to uh, take care of yourself. Tobacco use, uh, if you smoke or use uh, chewing tobacco or any form of nicotine, just you need to quit. There's no other if, ands, or buts about that. Uh, African Americans tend to have higher rates of uh, high blood pressure. Uh, pregnant women for gestational hypertension, and then we'll get back to oral contraceptives. Birth control pills do increase your risk of uh, high blood pressure. Once you get to the age of 35, well, guess what? I guess everything starts to go downhill at 35 officially, according to the medical community. So uh, that's, when you're, that's when your risk of high blood pressure goes up from there. And the other thing we're going to, we'll talk about that in more detail, which is uh, diets high in salt. And I think the, I'll show you some stuff that you may or may not know. All right, so if we get into things that we can do to help prevent or treat, that's just not necessarily prevent, but treat uh, high blood pressure, we get to renal artery stenosis. So these are what we call secondary causes of high blood pressure. In other words, you have high blood pressure because of some other problem. And this is a nice little picture here. This is the aorta. This is the big blood vessel that runs down along the spine. It carries blood to all, all, the, other, all the other blood vessels branch off of the aorta. This is going off to the uh, uh, kidney on the right side. This is going off to the kidney on the left side. And you can see this looks nice and nice and dark. And then this one looks like somebody took a bite out of it, and then it shows up over here. Well, this is a blockage. This is what it looks like when we're in the cath lab and we take pictures of these things. And that's what we call renal artery stenosis. So what that does is you can see it doesn't look, it's not all that hard. You look here. Boy, it looks like blood's going this way just fine. Going this way, ooh, it doesn't look like it's going very well. So those blood vessels are lining up one by one to get through there, or the blood cells at least. What happens then is that that kidney doesn't see much blood. So it thinks that there's not much blood in the system. Its pressure is low. So you're going to have high pressure here, and this blockage causes this pressure to be low. So this kidney will see low blood pressure. That kidney will then release hormones into the system to cause the blood vessels to constrict to get itself more blood. Well, it does that at the expense of all the rest of the system. So all the rest of the blood pressure goes up in the entire system just to push more blood to that kidney. Different ways we can look at it. The first one was an angiogram. Uh, the other way we can look at it, this is what it looks like on ultrasound. So if we look at the Doppler, this is actually the same stuff that the guys on the TV do for weather. It's just a lot smaller scale. So this would be some tornadoes and hurricanes and stuff in here as it's going through. But you can see right there, there that looks like there's a pretty good blockage there. Over here, this is what's called an MRA, magnetic resonance angiography. It's very similar to an MRI, except we look just at the vessels. And again, you can see going off this way, it looks good. There's a pinch here and a pinch there. Now. Usually there's just one artery going to the kidneys, but it's not uncommon to have uh, kidney arteries that will have uh, an upper and a lower, so that's why that one's got two. So what do we do to fix it? Well, here we're back in the cath lab. This is a catheter. This is the stuff that we see. So one of my partners, uh, Dr. Hibbard, uh, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Gardner, all, all do these, put stents, in the, put stents in the kidneys. So you take a little wire and you wiggle it through there, and that's what you see out here. That's the wire. And then you put in a little balloon with a little wire scaffolding on it called a stent. Then you deploy that in there and you open it up. And then that's what it looks like when you're done. So what that does is takes that blood flow, that pressure drop, and opens it up so the pressure is the same here and here. So that kidney sees the pressure that everybody else sees. What happens then is the kidney stops secreting all of those hormones to raise the blood pressure, and then that will help bring the blood pressure down. All right, I told you we'd talk a little bit about sleep apnea. Now, this sleep apnea is, uh, is, a, is a talk in itself, and I imagine Justin's had somebody up here at some point talking about sleep apnea, uh, probably one of the lung folks. Sleep apnea is a, becoming a bigger and bigger problem. As the population gets bigger and bigger, uh, the incidence of sleep apnea gets bigger and bigger. Basically, sleep. what happens in sleep apnea is you quit breathing in the middle of the night. As you can see by the definition there, you get closer of your upper airway. Now, 
if you want to know what it's like to have sleep apnea, of course, keep in mind a lot of this is happening when you're asleep, hence the word sleep. But if you want to know what's going on when you're sleeping, cover your mouth, plug your nose, and inhale as hard as you can. It's really an uncomfortable feeling. That's essentially what's going on. It causes a lot of pressure buildup in the chest, which affects the heart, which affects the lungs. It promotes high blood pressure in the lungs. It promotes high blood pressure in the rest of the body. It increases your risk of heart rhythm abnormalities. It increases your risk of um, heart failure. And it also makes you dead sooner. That's the one that usually gets everybody's attention. So the treatment of sleep apnea is, is really important. So how do you know if you've got it? This kind of, sometimes it's kind of hard because everybody can say, well, heck, I got three or four of those. But you get restlessness. Maybe you get restless at night. You just can't necessarily get comfortable. Snoring. Folks who snore have a much higher incidence of uh, sleep apnea. So if you've got that, if, you, if, you, if your uh, partner snores so loud that you're sleeping in a different room, that's probably a good sign that maybe you need to have them checked. If you wake up a lot at night, if you gotta wake up to pee, that's one thing, but if you're waking up because uh, uh, you're snoring or your breathing patterns are waking you up, that may be something uh, abnormal. Morning headache, that's also very common. It's, uh, once again, try that plug in your nose and breathing in. It, uh, it really puts a lot of stress on the system. And the other one is excessive daytime sleepiness. We see this a lot when folks come in with high blood pressure and we start talking to them about uh, how they feel. And they'll say, you know, I just get tired all the time. I find out that, uh, that I get up in the morning, and by the time I get done with breakfast, I just got to go take a nap. And other folks, you'll fall, they'll get really tired driving, or they'll fall asleep driving, which is really dangerous. So excessive daytime sleepiness is, uh, is probably one of the, the, the bigger things. The other one is if your spouse or your significant other says, you know, it just sounds like he quits breathing in the middle of the night. And every now and then I gotta poke him just because I wanna make sure he ain't dead. Uh, maybe you're hoping he's dead, I don't know, but you gotta poke him, make sure he wakes up. That's a really good sign. That's probably one of the best predictors that, uh, uh, that uh, you have sleep apnea. What do you do for it? Well, you have these little masks here. These are just, uh, this is just one. I don't know if I have a slide of the other ones. And this is a little machine. There's probably 15, 20 different types of masks. But the treatment for this is to essentially apply uh, either CPAP or BiPAP. And what that stands for is continuous positive airway pressure. We don't just give these things goofy acronyms for the heck of it. So what that does is it pushes, essentially pushes air in to help keep the airway open. And people who use CPAP routinely their fatigue goes away, they feel so much, they tend to feel so much better, and their blood pressures all of a sudden become easier to control. Uh, I have several people, I just saw one today, he was only 41, who has just got diagnosed with severe sleep apnea. He's on five different blood pressure medications. I'm suspecting that once he finally gets started on the, he's gonna need what's called BiPAP, but once he finally gets started on that, uh, I'm going to be anxious to see if we can hopefully start coming off on a couple of those medications. On five different blood pressure medications, his blood pressure in clinic today was still 180 over 100. That's really high. Uh, and at 41, he's in, for, he's in for a long haul with heart problems and other things if, uh, if, we don't get that, if we don't get that sleep apnea treated. And his sleep study did show that he had pretty severe sleep apnea. All right, so here's probably the part that you guys are the most interested. What can you do to lower your blood pressure and or uh, prevent yourself from getting it in the first place? And we'll talk about each of these. You got exercise, lose weight, get rid of your salt, control your alcohol use, stop smoking. That's a no-brainer. You get a big duh for that one if you're still smoking. And take your, take your medications. That's another, that's another big one. If, if, um, if you do have high blood pressure, you, you, taking your medications is a very important uh, part of it. A lot of people, lots of people don't like to take medications. Nobody really likes to take medications, but it is really important that you do to keep that blood pressure controlled. So we'll start off with the medications. There's all kinds of different kinds of medications. 
Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on this. The angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers, these are two uh, kind of kissing cousin different uh, medications. Uh, these actually uh, will be used preferentially in people with heart failure and or diabetes. They help protect the kidneys. They also help uh, uh, treat heart failure and, and reduce your risk of having problems from heart failure. Beta blockers, you'll see us use these uh, in a lot of folks, primarily in folks with heart failure. They're very good and they have been probably the best medications to show to prolong life in folks with heart failure. So we'll see, you see beta blockers with those folks. Uh, diuretics, if you're retaining fluid or you have a, a salt, big salt component to your blood pressure, if you have a salt sensitive blood pressure, the diuretics will uh, help b uh, move salt out of the body. And when they move salt out of the body, the um, uh, fluid will go with it and that will help bring down the blood pressure. Alpha blockers, these are, these are kind, of a, um, kind of a fourth line drug for treating high blood pressure. Uh, they help relax the vessels. They sometimes have a, uh, make you feel like you got a dry mouth and a little fatigue, so we don't, we don't use these as much as we have to. If you do have fairly resistant high blood pressure or you're intolerant to a lot of stuff, you will often end up here. Then the calcium channel blockers, those are good medications. Those tend to work uh, really well in folks. They also work well in folks who have the stiffer arteries where the, the, uh, th these, this class, these three medications over here don't seem to work quite as well. Obesity. This is a big problem and getting bigger, no pun intended. So if we look at the number of people who have obesity, this is, uh, this is really kind of a sobering slide. 129.3 million people are overweight or obese, and of those, 61 million are obese. Now, this isn't defined as what your opinion of yourself is. This is defined as what's called a body mass index of uh, over 30. Uh, a body mass index of 25 to 30 is overweight. So it's, a, it's, more, of a medical, it's more of a medical measurement. But still, 62... Uh, or 61 million Americans, and this is an older slide, so I imagine this number is actually quite a bit higher. It's fairly balanced between men and women. Uh, this is just another way of looking at it. So this is data from the, the CDC, and if you look at this by states, this is back in 1994, so all the states reported their obesity rate. So the light blue which there are none, is less than 10%. The medium blue is 10 to 14%. You can see there's a fair number of those. And then 15 to 19% in the darker blue. That's 1994. If we come up to 2001, we've only got one holdout that's left in the light blue. We've got some more in the darker blue, but we've added two new categories. We've added the one in five category and the one in four category. Something about that Mississippi River draining down there just ain't too healthy for you. We come to 2005. So now look at all the different states where you got one in four. Now we're up to one in three. One in three adults is obese, not overweight. So this doesn't include overweight, this is just obese. And then the latest data is from 2010. I don't even know why they, in the key down here, I don't even know why they show the blue anymore because it does, hasn't existed for quite some time. But if you look at this, look at the number of states with an obesity rate of one in three. So this is a, this is a really, really big problem. And as you go through and look at those, look at those graphs, you can see how, how over the last uh, 15 years we've just been fattening up. And the sad part is it's not just the grown-ups. The obesity rate in children is going up uh, incredibly fast. 30% of children ages 6 to 11 are overweight, and 15% of those are obese. And this is the part down here that's the scariest. So it's one thing to have a bunch of chubby little kids running around. Uh, the, and there's a lot of people out there, and this will be, you can chalk this up into the personal opinion category. There's a lot of people up there that are worried about everybody's self-esteem and all that other hoo-ha. As a cardiologist, this is what I worry about. 
I don't care about your self-esteem. I care about your arteries and your organs because that's what kills you. Uh, the rate of childhood diabetes, now this isn't type 1 diabetes, which is the kind where your pancreas fails and you just don't make insulin anymore. This is type 2 diabetes, or what we used to call adult onset diabetes. This is the diabetes that you get from being overweight, out of shape, and what we call insulin resistant. It's, in this population, it's almost entirely preventable. So it's going up at alarming, at alarming rates. So it, it may be one thing to, to uh, uh, tell folks that it's okay to be happy with who you are and you're overweight. That's, that's, that's great and it'll put a smile on your face, but I tell you what, at 35, that'll put you in my office. Uh, I have sent, the youngest person I have sent to bypass surgery is 28 years old. When I got into this business, I didn't think that would ever happen. I figured I was in the 65 and older club. Uh, it's not uncommon anymore for us to take people to the cath lab that are in their 40s. Uh, it, it's really impressive, and, and I'm, what I'm afraid of is that this generation here is going to have a lot of problems. Actually, uh, Dr. Bob, Bob Rahner, I don't know if you guys know Dr. Bob Rahner. Uh, he does a lot of public health work and has just been really instrumental in Lincoln at uh, looking at this stuff. He's a family practice uh, doctor. But uh, he had a slide that I don't have in this slide deck. But this coming generation, the, the children, the generation that the children are in right now, is the first generation in a thousand years that are predicted to have a lifespan shorter than the generation before them. So it's kind of a sobering fact, by about five years, actually. So how does obesity affect your blood pressure? Well, it makes it go up. Overweight individuals have a three-fold increase in the risk of developing high blood pressure. The prevalence of diabetes, in other words, the, the, the percentage of people, not diabetes, the percentage of high blood pressure in people with obesity is 50%. So the prevalence uh, is, remember, the, the number of people that have a disease in any population. So it's about half. So the, in the obese population, about half of folks will have high blood pressure. The Framingham study, this is something you see quoted in cardiology a lot. It's a big study. They followed people for a long time. They've actually followed a couple of generations of people. They followed their cholesterols. They followed their blood pressures, their dietary habits, all of these things. It's a big observational study. And uh, what they found that the correlation between excess body fat and high blood pressure, 70% of the new cases of, of essential hypertension were basically hypertension that, that uh, because that's the way you're put together, they could trace back to increases in body fat. And roughly for every 10 pounds of weight gain, uh, on average, you'll go up 4.5 millimeters of mercury. So, you know, on a population standpoint, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty high. Exercise. Who in here exercises regularly? Oh, good. We got to preach into the choir tonight, huh? Who exercises once in a while? Who thinks exercise is what other people do? Ah, there's a bunch of liars out there. <laughs> All right, so exercise and blood pressure. Obviously, if, if, uh, if exercise didn't make your blood pressure go down, I wouldn't be showing this slide. So uh, there's an inverse relation between exercise. The more you exercise, the better your blood pressure control tends to be. Um, and as you can see, the exercise training can offset that uh, increase that you get from obesity. So uh, getting, get, trying to get back in shape, doing the exercise, really does, really does make a difference. And here's the, uh, here are the statistics from the American Heart Association. 28% of Americans, eight, 18 or older, don't do diddly squat. They don't do diddly squat. Uh, some days I think that's a lot higher depending on how my day's going in clinic. 44% uh, get some exercise, but they don't do it enough or at a high enough intensity to help their hearts. Only about 27% of folks do enough cardio, do enough exercise to be cardiovascular healthy, so to, to actually do have any, any real benefit. So these are the folks that kind of go out and go for a little stroll. You know, they say, well, I walk. Well, 
you're walking, but you're kind of strolling. You stop at the neighbor's house, you talk to the neighbor for a while, and you're out there walking, you get three blocks done in about three hours. That's being outside and being active. Uh, it's not necessarily exercise. Likewise, I love the guys that come in and I ask them if they're doing exercise. How many of you guys honestly have looked at your physician and said, I golf? Really? When was golf last considered exercise? Last I knew, most of the guys I know, golf is simply drinking beer outside. <laughs> if you're using a cart, it's not exercise. So, and these folks, you gotta get, get up and do something. Now we do have um, uh, folks that live uh, kind of a bit more on the south side of town, it's a little more convenient, but down at Bryan Life Point, we have a, uh, a program called Life Fit. Yeah, it's a neat little program. It's a 60-day program, and uh, it's, it's, really, it's pretty doggone cheap. It's 60 days for 60 bucks, so a buck a day. And what we're looking at is we're targeting these folks right here, because there's a lot of these folks that I think are somewhat interested in exercise, but really have no idea how to do it or what to do. So you come down, and uh, you get a prescription from your physician to, to do the LifeFit program, and they will build a program for you, you get full run of the entire facility. So if you tell me that your knee hurts or your back hurts, that's great. Guess what? We do physical therapy, cardiac rehab, pulmonary rehab. Whatever you, whatever's ailing you, we have something that you can use. Uh, there's a warm water pool. There's a regular pool. So whatever your excuse is, I can got something for you to do. Um, so uh, that's something that you guys can, can look into. It's really important. Tell your loved ones about it. Uh, I can't stress how important physical activity really is. What does it do for you? Well, there's a whole lot of medical stuff on here because sometimes I use this slide when I talk to uh, uh, medical folks, but basically makes your heart more efficient. Reduces myocardial oxygen demand. So when you get up and walk around, uh, it's, it's kind of like having a, 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 a motor in your car that gets a lot better gas mileage. It makes your heart more efficient when you exercise. You obviously you get increased exercise performance, reduces your blood pressure control, everybody knows all that stuff. Here's some of the other interesting things. Improves your endothelial function. What on God's earth does that mean? It makes your vessels do what they're supposed to do. You know, endothelial function, it, the endothelium is the lining inside of your blood vessels. And what a lot of people don't know is that's what controls whether your blood vessels constrict or relax. If your endothelium is not healthy, when the biochemicals that are floating around that tell the endothelium to relax, with an unhealthy endothelium, it will do the opposite. It will contract. And so when you get up and you get exercising, you can get your endothelium to start doing what it's supposed to do. Enhances fibrinolysis. That's a big $50 phrase for your blood is less likely to clot. Well, then most of you are thinking, well, gosh, that means I'm going to bleed to death. No, it doesn't mean you're going to bleed to death. Where is this important? This is really important when you're talking about the arteries of your heart and you're talking about the arteries of your brain. If you clot in the arteries of your heart, you have a heart attack, and you get to come visit me in a ball of fire, and we get to do what's called heart catheterization and have a lot of fun, at least for me. If it happens in your brain, you have a stroke. Nobody wants to have a stroke. Reduces platelet reactivity. Those things go together. Those are the two things that make your blood less likely to clump. Here's another one. This is one of those little statistics that I like to show. So mortality data suggests that about a quarter of a million people, 250,000 people die every year because their butt is growing roots into the sofa. The only exercise they do are thumb push-ups on the remote control and walking to the refrigerator and the toilet. 2011, the population of Lincoln was 262,000 people according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Lincoln dies every year because people don't get up and do anything. That's pretty profound. Now, recommendation is 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise daily. Now, what does moderate intensity mean? Once again, it's not a three block walk in three hours, strolling around just saying hi to everybody. It's getting up, walking at a good pace, or what I tell folks is you don't have to worry about your heart rate or any of that other stuff. I just want you up, I want you walking, whether it's, uh, I don't care if it's walking, swimming, biking, doing a new step, an elliptical trainer, I, swimming, I don't care what it is. But I want you working at a pace where you're breathing a little bit faster than you do normally. I want you, you know, well, my wife tells me that ladies don't sweat, they glow. So if you're a lady, I want you glowing. 
If you're a guy, I want you sweating. On the other hand, I don't want you breathing so hard that you can't talk to the person next to you. So if you and your spouse are out for a walk, and you're walking, and you got to take a breath between sentences, then you're working too hard. Then you need to walk, then you need to work it back a little bit because you've gone from aerobic or oxygen burning metabolism to anaerobic, which is a whole different type of metabolism. So just, you don't have to worry about your heart rate and all that other stuff. Just get out, get a good brisk walk or pedal or whatever it is you're doing. 30 minutes, five days a week. You can give me five days a week. Now, I heard a statistic a while back. Uh, ironically, it was on the TV. Uh, I don't watch much TV, but I was watching the news. Uh, on the treadmill a couple of years ago, and um, the newscaster, the bobbling head guy, said that the average American watches four hours of television every day. Four hours. That is an insane amount of television. That's an insane amount of time to sit there looking at something that makes you stupid. I just want 30 minutes of your four hours. You can put your treadmill in front of the TV and walk on the TV or walk while you're watching the TV. You got a sitcom. Sitcoms are 30 minutes. Walk while you're watching your sitcom. If you're really at it, go walk, watch, uh, watch something for an hour. Uh, my wife likes, uh, there's a couple of shows that she likes, and so she just does the Netflix and walks on the treadmill while she watches, uh, watches the Netflix. So those are just some ideas. Scheduled activity, obviously, these are some things that we, we try to get you to do. Walk your dog. Dog, I'm a big dog fan. I love dogs. Dogs love to be walked. They'll love you to death for it. Dog loves you. To, you can lock your dog in the trunk, and the dog will love you to death. But if you take him for a walk, he'll really like you. Uh, just take a baggie. It's uh, one of those state law things. It also works for your husband in case he can't leave the fire hydrant. So take a baggie. Lifestyle. Here's some easy things to do. Take the stairs at work. I don't care if it's one flight or two flights. If you got to go up 13 flights, okay, fine. I'm not going to harp on you. Use the elevator. But this is Lincoln. Where's the 13-story building around here? Take the stairs at work. Walk farther or park farther away. Don't fight the handicapped people, unless you're handicapped, for the spot at Walmart. Park in the back. Nobody parks there. There's plenty of room. Walk up. Now, I'll cut you some slack if it's raining if it's 17 degrees below zero, sure, park close. So you'll be parked right next to me. Otherwise, you can park in the back of the parking lot. There's tons of places back there. Nobody's going to ding your car either. Uh, gardening, these are good, nice, active things to get out and do. They don't necessarily substitute for, uh, uh, for, for sustained exercise, but even getting out and just doing more active things in your lifestyle can make, can make a big difference. All right, move on to salt. Sodium. People love salt. So the recommended intake is about 2,300 milligrams a day. That's, uh, that came from a study called the DASH diet, or the DASH study, D-A-S-H, and it was a study that looked at high blood pressure in Americans and, and uh, looked at folks on a regular diet versus a diet that was high in fruits, vegetables, and, and low salt. And that was kind of the cutoff that they found was at 2,300 milligrams, you had a lot better response with your blood pressure. However, the average American is about twice that. About twice that. So we really do, we really do, like, we really do like salty stuff. So where does it come from? Well, some of it comes from cooking. You got to season your food. And nobody's going to fault you for seasoning a little bit. Uh, eating, well, what's eating? Well, that's, you put some salt in it when you cooked it. Well, and then Leonard, he's got to put some salt on it. How many of you salt your, your tomatoes out of the garden? Yeah, I've met some folks that said you just can't eat them without salt on them. But, so you got to put a little salt on stuff when you're eating it. That's kind of what we found out. 12% of it is natural. In other words, everything has salt in it. Celery has salt in it. It's just part of nature. We have salt in us. We're full of salt water. Everything has salt in it. So you're going to get some sodium naturally, and you, that, that's unavoidable. Here's the kicker. 77% of all the salt you eat is already in the food. It's the processed foods. Soups, ham. Ham is just pink salt. It's tasty, but it's just pink salt. 
There's lots of stuff that's got a lot of sodium in it. I like to call that sneaky salt because uh, when I talk to patients about salt, the first thing they tell me is, well, I don't use the salt shaker. Go back to that previous slide. Great, you've just cut maybe 6% of all the salt out of your diet. However, 77%, which is what's really killing you, is still there. Canned vegetables, uh, open them up, rinse them off, because uh, you do your best to get the salt out of them that way. Anything that comes out of a can, soups. Soup is good food if you don't have high blood pressure. If you do have high blood pressure, there's a lot of salt in there. Soy sauce is brown salt water. Uh, pickled foods, dill pickles, those types of things. Sauerkraut, I love sauerkraut, but man, that's seriously salty stuff. And frozen dinners. Basically, if you have to take cellophane off of what you're about to eat, it has a lot of salt in it. So what if you go to the mall? Everybody likes pizza. One slice of pizza, 1,582 milligrams. Guess what? You better like that celery because that's what you're having for the rest of the day after you eat that pizza. How many of y'all here eat just one piece of pizza, too? Now you get that two pieces, you're up, you're up, but you're, you're into next day's salt. A Whopper, 980 milligrams of salt in a Whopper. Restaurant Chinese food, now we're talking some serious salt. 2,400 milligrams of salt in the, in the chow mein. That's why you get all, you wonder why you eat the Chinese food and you're all swole up the next day. You can't see your ankles anymore. It's because of all that salt. Because keep in mind, that's just the salt you got from eating that. That doesn't include all the salt you ate and all the rest of the stuff that day. This is my favorite, fajitas. Personally, I love fajitas. I think fajitas are great. I like the whole sizzling thing. I, I like it. I, I just think fajitas are great. Uh, this was an eye-opener for me. 400 or 4,450 milligrams in fajitas. It must just be why they taste so good. That's a lot. I mean, you're, you're getting up in the two-day range in just that one meal. So you're going out to eat. As you notice, a lot of this stuff was restaurant stuff. Going out to eat is really hard to do to avoid salt. The American public is so hooked on salt and sugar and fat that the restaurants and all the, the food manufacturers make things that will sell. They're in business. Even if it says healthy this or healthy that, you know, that's, they're, they're in business to sell products. So they will make stuff that tastes good. Tender grilled chicken. You think, oh, well, I'll go to the, I'm not get that darn Whopper. I'm going to get that grilled chicken. Guess what? There's 200 more milligrams of sodium in the grilled chicken than there is in the Whopper. You're getting less fat, but, man, you're getting a lot of salt. The Subway turkey. Yeah, that Jared guy, he lost a whole bunch of weight, but he obviously didn't have high blood pressure because it's full of that uh, processed meat. So one of the things I tell folks is that if the meat you're eating is not the shape that it's in when it's in the animal that it came from, it's been processed and it's probably full of food or full of salt. Now, once again, you're a lot better off from the calorie standpoint, but you got a lot of salt in there. Healthy choice, a little bit better. Uh, drop down to 500 milligrams, so that's that's actually pretty good. So if you're gonna if you're gonna move towards uh, low salt stuff, the the healthy choice line does does a respectable job. And Campbell's low sodium soups actually do pretty good too. Look at this. So here's uh, chicken noodle soup, 990 milligrams, and then the low sodium brings it all the way down to 140 milligrams. So there's a lot of there's a lot of salt in in soups. Read the label. So I tell folks that don't shop by the front of the boxes. The front of the boxes are pretty, they're flashy, they're designed by people that make an incredible amount of money to design boxes that you will buy. They don't care whether you end up in my office or not. This is where you need to learn to shop. Okay, And this is a whole talk in and of itself. Uh, the, the dietitians down at uh, down at LifePoint uh, do really good programs off and on throughout the year, and can help you help you learn how to, to look through all this stuff. But basically, you can look on the back and see how much salt is in something. Here's the kicker: start at the top. Look at the serving size. I'm willing to bet what you think a serving size is 
is not what they think a serving size is. I'm willing to bet that your serving size is two to three servings of whatever's on there. So when you start looking at the calories and you start looking at the salt, look at how much you're eating and uh, make sure you up calculate appropriately because uh, a lot of people don't a lot of people don't pay attention to that 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 whole serving size thing. Alcohol. All right, some people are totally against alcohol. Some people drink off and on. Some people uh, drink till they don't know where they live anymore. Uh, but here are the rules. So the guidelines are one to two a day for men. So not necessarily two, but up to two a day for men. And one drink a day for women. And that has more to do with the average body mass for men than women as, as opposed to just plain being unfair. So what's a drink? A drink is 12 ounces of beer. An ounce and a half of uh, hard alcohol, whether it's uh, gin, vodka, bourbon, scotch, you name it. Or five ounces of wine. Now, keep in mind that uh, when you go, I'm sure when you're at home and you're having a glass of wine with dinner, it's probably five ounces or so. But uh, just keep that in mind that if you have several 12-ounce beers, that's more than two. If you have an eight ounce martini, that's more than one and a half. And if you have your wine glass, so next, you, I don't know how big your wine glasses are, but some of the wine glasses nowadays are pretty big. Pour five ounces, measure five ounces, and then put it in your wine glass. And then look where your wine usually runs up to. So there's a lot of uh, 10 ounce, there's a lot of 10 ounce wine glasses out there. So that's my little spiel about alcohol. Personally, I'm this guy. That's why I put that one in there. Friday night is martini night, so. But. Caffeine. Caffeine is one of those things that has been much maligned. Uh, everybody uh, that comes into the office, whether their blood pressure's high or they've got palpitations or they think they're having their hearts racing, they always tell me, I've cut out caffeine. And I say, that's great, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you are a habitual caffeine drinker, your body gets used to it, and it doesn't really play a big role in causing you to have high blood pressure. It doesn't really cause a big role in causing you to have rhythm problems. Now, that being said, some people are more sensitive to the stimulants like caffeine, and they can uh, take a cup of coffee, and they'll get their heart racing, and their blood pressure go up. But if you're a two or three cup a day, or if uh, one of those folks, your blood pressure is not going to spike, your heart rate's not going to race, and you'll be okay. They've done some studies. Uh, the nurses' health study showed that uh, uh, coffee didn't seem to have much of an effect. The caffeinated cola, it turns out, is probably diet cola. might have more of a role in blood pressure, but nothing that was uh, statistically significant. They looked at some uh, medical students, and the combination of coffee and stress increased the blood pressure. I think it's more likely to be the stress than it was uh, the coffee. Uh, down here in Switzerland, they like their coffee. No difference between habitual and non-habitual coffee drinkers. And then, once again, the, AA, the AHA, American Heart Association, one to two drinks a day. Basically, when, when, when they come down to stuff like this for coffee, the, the evidence behind this is pretty wimpy. It basically is, we really don't know. So just if you do a little bit of it, it's probably okay. If you do too much, it's probably bad. If you're one of those folks who's putting down a pot of coffee on your own, that's probably a little strong. You should probably back off a little bit. A couple cups of coffee a day is unlikely to make any difference in your, in your life, except it might make you happier in the morning. Stress. If you don't like your job, if you work long hours, if you're depressed, if you feel hopeless, all of those things do uh, cause some hormonal changes. They're subtle. They're not the kind of hormone changes you can take a pill for. They're not the kind of hormone changes you can measure, but they do uh, change just some of the cortisol levels and other things in the body enough that it does run the blood pressure up. So uh, if your work really does stink, well, then maybe you should think about getting a different job. Uh, if you're having some problems with depression, by all means, come in, talk to your health care provider. Let's get that treated because depression can cause a whole lot of things, and one of those is uh, having your blood pressure go up. So getting that treated uh, will make a big difference. The other thing is if you are depressed, it really has a cascading effect. So it may bring your blood pressure up, but it also decreases your interest in exercise. It tends to make you eat more. 
So it drives weight up, drives your, your physical fitness down. And so, it, like I said, it has this cascading effect. So if you think you got some issues with depression, by all means, come in and let's get working on getting those fixed. All my patients that have high blood pressure, I ask them if they measure their blood pressures at home and encourage them to stop by the CVS or the Walgreens or the Walmart or whatever mart you want to go to to get a blood pressure cuff. There's different kinds, all kinds of different kinds. There's the wrist kind. Uh, those, for most people, are going to be just fine. The nice thing about those is they're the easiest to put on. However, the ones that are a little bit more accurate are going to be the ones that you wrap around, you wrap around your forearm. Or I'm sorry, your upper arm. So the general rule is the closer you get to your heart, the more accurate the blood pressure is going to be. Now, realistically, your upper arm is about as close as you can get to your, blood, your, your, uh, your heart uh, and still measure the blood pressure without having to poke you with a needle or do something insulting to you. So stop by. The, if you do have high blood pressure, stop by whatever mart you prefer. Pick one of these up. They range in price from $20 to $200. They have all kinds of uh, bells and whistles. Uh, some of them have memory. Some of them will wirelessly connect to your iPhone. Uh, just Whatever it is you want them to do, you can find one out there that will do it. The important thing is, after you buy one, use it. Check your blood pressure. Write down the top number, the bottom number, and then uh, usually they'll have a pulse on there somewhere. This one has a pulse right here. So. Uh, you know, put your pulse on there and just keep keep track of that. You don't have to measure it every day. You don't have to measure it six times a day. I did have one guy come in and in the span of 30 minutes, he took his blood pressure 30 times. I told him we don't even measure it that closely in the intensive care unit. You can back off a little. Um, if you want to check it in the morning one day, you want to check it in the evening one day, in the middle of the day one day, that's fine. Whatever, whatever, whatever trips your trigger. But what that does is it gives us a great picture of what your blood pressure is actually doing. So we get folks that come in, and their blood pressure is really high in the office. I had a lady who came in, and whenever she is just again today in clinic, who came in, and her blood pressure was 178 over 80. And she says, well, my blood pressure is never that high. And so she brings in her blood pressure record, and she's consistently around 120. 125 at home. There's something about me that seems to scare the bejesus out of her. Uh, on the other hand, I got a handful of folks that come in and they say, oh, you know, my blood pressure's up every time I come to see the doctor. And I say, and it's maybe 160 over 85. They really? Well, what does it run at home? Oh, about the same. <laughs> so, uh, checking it at home really does tell us a lot. It helps us. It really does help us out. And just uh, just another little anecdotal goofy story. I did have one lady who came in, uh, and, and when she came in, her blood pressure was sky high every single time she came in. And every single blood pressure I, medication I tried to put her on made her dizzy. Uh, and so I thought, well, how can one person be allergic to this many medications? Well, she ended up uh, having some chest pain, and we ended up doing a heart catheterization. And during that heart catheterization, we realized, because we're measuring her blood pressure the entire time, her blood pressure was really about 110. And so every time that she would come in, because she, did, she wasn't checking it at home, so every time she came in, her blood pressure was sky high. So do, trying to do the right thing to treat her blood pressure, I put her on a blood pressure pill. She'd go home, and then her blood pressure would go too low, and she'd get dizzy. So her heart doctor was trying to kill her, but he didn't know that. <laughs> so another good reason why you need to be checking your blood pressure at home. So. All right, just to kind of wrap things up so nobody, not everybody falls asleep and, and uh, uh, has drool on their chin. Millions of Americans have uh, high blood pressure, 67 million, and a lot of them have poor control. One-fifth are not diagnosed, so they don't know they have it, and only 47% are actually treated to their goal. Now, I will backtrack a little bit and say that one of the things that we found out is that the older you get and you start getting into the, the 80, 85, and up, our goals really do change. So we're not trying to drive you down to 120 we found that if we drive those folks down too far, that uh, actually complications go up because uh, vessels tend to, tend, as we age, tend to stiffen up. 
And those folks actually do need a higher need to run a higher blood pressure. So, uh, and some some older older folks will target uh, more closer to the 140. But in the otherwise normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. That's what we're all shooting for. Prehypertension's in the middle. Um, most of it is uh, essential hypertension. In other words, you have it because you have it. And keep in mind, most of us are going to develop it if you live long enough. Exercise, weight loss, watching your salt, these are the cornerstones right here. It, you can never start too early in getting yourself adjusted to a lower salt diet. Uh, you know, you get somebody in and for 75 years, Leonard's been eating heavy salt on everything, it's going to be really hard to change. And it's going to make him grouchy, but it's one of those things we have to do. So uh, if you've got younger kids or you've got grandkids, Start working on getting them so they're not used to such a high salt content or high sugar content in their diet. It'll make a, make a big difference uh, uh, later on. Exercise. Don't underestimate the power of exercise. It's another thing we could talk for another hour and a half on is just the benefits of exercise in all the different ways in terms of the muscle strength, in terms of the, your stability. You're less likely to fall. If you're less likely to fall, you're less likely to break your hip, break your shoulder, 25% uh, of people that fall and break a hip will die. That's pretty sobering. They will die because of it. They won't necessarily die on the spot, but they will die of some, some complication related to breaking that hip. Another large percentage of those folks will end up in nursing homes. So get, get your, the more you exercise, the stronger your legs are, you're less likely to fall. It makes your bones stronger. That's important in ladies. I'm sure a lot of you are out there taking vitamin D and calcium. Some of you are probably taking other medications because of osteoporosis, getting up, moving around, doing weight-bearing exercises where gravity is pulling down on your body will make your bones stronger. So those are just some non-cardiac things that you can, you can think about. And uh, I guess with that, I'll quit preaching. I'm starting to get a little, little soapboxy up here. So.